coming up next on Business Minds Coffee Chat. Every problem is just a problem, and every problem has steps towards solutions. So this one was big and existential, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't just a problem that we could come up with a plan for. Right? I mean, nothing short of a alien invasion from outer space is an alien invasion from outer space. Everything else is just a problem to solve. And I try to apply that to just my everyday life, too. Every thing that I have to do is just a thing to do. And I will focus on it and I will do the best at it. And then we're going to move on to the next. And at the end of the day, you look back and you say, huh, look what I accomplished. The fact that you're listening to this podcast tells me that you're someone who values their time and is interested in improvement and growth. I've learned over the years that those who want to get better, who want to sharpen their skills, hire coaches. I started my coaching business because I saw firsthand how having the right coach transformed a family member's business and life. This had a profound impact on me, and it's my mission to help others have a similar positive experience. If you've ever thought about hiring a business coach, check this out. Working with me as your coach, you'll gain more clarity on your goals and priorities, be held accountable, learn and apply the tools to maximize your potential, build a rock-solid foundation for your business, and achieve the results and success you deserve. Warren Buffett said, the best investment you can make is in yourself. If you're ready to commit to your personal and professional development, let nothing hold you back. To apply to my coaching program and to schedule a call with me to learn more, just visit jshearbusinessconsulting.com and click the Book Now button at the top. I look forward to hearing from you. And now, enjoy the latest episode. Hi, this is Jason Pfeiffer, and you're listening to Business Minds Coffee Chat with Jay Shear. This is Business Minds Coffee Chat, where those interested in personal and professional growth come to listen to and learn from extraordinary business leaders, thought leaders, best-selling authors, renowned psychologists, neuroscientists, and others who are changing the world through the work they do. I'm your host, Jay Shear. Welcome to the conversation. Viktor Frankl said, when we can no longer change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. The moments of greatest change can also be the moments of greatest opportunity. On today's episode, we talk about embracing change, becoming more resilient and adaptable, and future-proofing your career and life. My guest is a husband and father, the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine, author, keynote speaker, startup advisor, and podcast host of not one, but two popular podcasts. He's been featured in Entrepreneur, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and other well-known media outlets. Please welcome the author of the new book, Build for Tomorrow, and the man who came to realize that opportunity set B will set you up for an unpredictable but extraordinary journey, Jason Pfeiffer. Jason, it is wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Thanks for that great introduction made all the better by your just excellent deep voice. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I am super excited that you're here and very excited to share all that you are going to share in our conversation with our audience today. So let's let's dive right in. I, I would love it if you would start by sharing with us what your favorite trait is about yourself. Huh. My favorite trait about myself is my energy level. I rely upon it. I push myself to sometimes ill-advised lengths, just in the amount that I have taken on for myself, sometimes the amount that I work, sometimes the amount that I travel. And I want to do all that, making sure that I'm also being mindful of my many other obligations, you know, including to my family. So for example, if I'm going to travel last week, I flew to Denver and back in the same day because I had a a speaking engagement over there, but I didn't want to be away overnight. uh, And uh, because I wanted to be able to be home, help uh, out with the kids. 
So I can only do that because I feel pretty confident that I can push myself and I just will not collapse. And so far that's true. And hopefully I won't find the limit. Interesting. So share with us then maybe some of the ways that you're able to cultivate or sustain the type of energy level that works best for you. What are some things that you do? Well, I think a big part of it is really what it takes to build anything great or to manage any kind of massive change or shift, which is to just take everything one at a time. You know, I, 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 I'm kind of constantly delighted by how something will seem extreme on my calendar. You know, there was a day last week also where I did four virtual, three virtual events, one in-person event. I had like three different podcast recordings and, you know, there wasn't really time to breathe during the day, but you know what, as you're going through it, you just think, all right, the next 30 minutes I'm doing this and I'm going to be mindful of that. And then after that, we will move on to the next thing and I'm going to take care of myself. There are some things that I just know about me that must be done. I must eat meals at regular times. I must have a decent night's sleep. I have two little kids, so I'm never going to get a good night's sleep, but decent. And it's not like, you know, it's funny. I've talked to entrepreneurs about how they have grappled with the greatest challenges they could possibly face. One of the first ones that spring to mind was when I interviewed uh, Jason Robbins, the founder of DraftKings, about what it was like trying to steer his company through the headwinds of regulation. There were these times where the Massachusetts and New, Turney, uh, New York attorneys general were threatening to pass laws that would basically put the company out of existence. And I asked him, what was that like? And he was like, well, look, it was just, you know, it was just another problem to solve, uh, right? I mean, every problem is just a problem and every problem has steps towards solutions. So this one was big and existential, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't just a problem that we could come up with a plan for, right? I mean, nothing short of a alien invasion from outer space is an alien invasion from outer space. Everything else is just a problem to solve. And I try to apply that to just my everyday life too. Every Thing that I have to do is just a thing to do. And I will focus on it and I will do the best at it. And then we're going to move on to the next. And at the end of the day, you look back and you say, huh, look what I accomplished. Well, speaking of those, those big challenges that we face, you know, when you think back over your uh, both personal and professional life thus far, can, can you speak to one of the bigger challenges that you faced? How did you address that challenge. And also, if you can speak to what you learned about yourself as you worked through that challenge. Well, I I will think about, I mean, look, I've been fired from jobs and um, had just a lot of confusion about what it is that I should do with my life and all that. But I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something that wasn't quite that, but that really made me think a lot about who I am and that led me in a way to talking with you right now, which is that when I first got to Entrepreneur Ma Magazine, this was 2015, I was the executive editor. So that's the number two. And then nine months later, the editor-in-chief left and I got the job. And so now I was editor-in-chief. And my background is not in entrepreneurship. My background is in media. So when I took over, I really thought of it as a media project. I felt pretty prepared for the media project part of it. I wasn't prepared for the way that everyone stopped treating me like a media guy and started treating me like a thought leader in entrepreneurship, as an authority in a space that I didn't feel particularly comfortable in. And I would get invited onto podcasts or onto stages and people would interview me, introduce me as a thought leader of some sort. And I would always try to dial it back in. No, no, no. I'm a really a storyteller. I'm a generalist, in fact. And I don't and you know, it was like falling downstairs. Like, dun, dun, dun. like I just people you I could watch as they were in a panic as I was undercutting the reason why they were having me at whatever event or something. And I was I felt like I was undercutting my own authority and it just, but it just, I, but I couldn't get over that. I just felt like such an imposter and I didn't want to overpromise on myself. And my, my wife gave me this great advice as I was telling her about this a long time ago, which was, she said, you know, if 
they want you to be a thought leader, then just be a thought leader. And I realized that the only difference between thought leader and not a thought leader, and just for the record, I hate that phrase. I think it's stupid, but you know, just as a placeholder for what we're talking about here, um, is that is that uh, the thought leader is willing to say they're a thought leader. This is literally the only difference. And so what I needed to do was set about understanding what it was that people expected from me so that I could, could rise to that occasion. And the more I thought about that, the more I realized, you know what, actually, there is a much larger opportunity here if I can figure that out. Because so far, my career has been about being relevant to an organization. But I have an opportunity to now be relevant to a very large number of people. And uh, and that is very, very exciting. And I think can open up opportunities that I can't even anticipate right now, but it has to start with thinking about who I am to all these people and making sure that I'm doing it in a way that is real and authentic. I will never, never, never be the guy who can tell you exactly how to run your business. It's not my background, but what do I know? Well, I know people, I know trying, I know striving, I know taking risks. I've done all that in my own career. I watch entrepreneurs do that too. And I'm a pretty good study of how people think. And I really love how people think. And so maybe I can lean into that and I can be comfortable owning one space and leaving other expertise to other people. And that led me to think about my value and my relevance and how to rethink who I am and what my professional goals and direction are. And the result of that is years and years and years of work, but where I also now have a book, it's very well received and well read, and I can have conversations like this with you who know probably a lot of things that I do not know and um, feel totally, totally comfortable doing it and make a good living at it too. Beautiful. So a couple of things that you said that I, yeah. I want to pull on the string. One is about your, your, your wife and what she shared with you, the piece of advice she, she gave to you. So your, your wife, uh, Jennifer is yeah. also a well-known author, published mm -hmm. author, written a number of books. I, I'm just curious in the, in the home, since you're both authors, what is that experience like in terms of exploring new ideas, sharing work with one another? Do you, edit each other's ideas and work? What, what is that space like for you as both being creators and using words to tell stories? You know, when we were first dating, Jen, and, and also just kudos for knowing um, something about my wife, that was good research you've done in advance of this episode. So when we were first dating, she was working on her first novel and she asked if I would edit it. And uh, that was a big undertaking and also a big risk. But her, she had written a nonfiction book before. So she was working on her second book. The first one was, it was reported. Now this was fiction, it was a novel. And um, and her boyfriend at the time in which that first book came out didn't even read the book. And she was testing me in a way. She wanted to make sure that I liked her work and that we could we could work well together. And I said, sure. And I made this decision uh, as I dug into it which was a really important one, which was, you know, I, my job when I'm working for a media company is to be the gatekeeper for the voice and perspective of that brand. So when I was an editor at Men's Health, which is where I was at the time of when we were dating, I, uh, you know, my job was to, to filter everything through what Men's Health needs. But I'm going to sit down and I'm going to read her novel. It's hers. She is the ultimate authority here. And so my job isn't to tell her that something is good or bad or works or doesn't work, but rather that if something doesn't quite work for me, if something isn't scanning, then my job is to ask her what her intention was here, to say, what were you going for in this scene? What What is the thing that needs to happen in this scene? Because I feel like when these characters made this decision, it didn't really make sense to me. And so I know that this is ultimately about getting these characters to some other place. So what what is important to you? And then let's try to figure out the best solution to that. And that was the approach that I took to her novel. And 
uh, you know, it, it clearly it worked. The novel was published, not because of me, but um, but I uh, would like to think I had some very small hand in it in at least giving her good feedback. And now we're married. And what we do with each other is we don't edit all of each other's work. That would just be impossible. The two of us are producing too much, but we are there if we need a gut check. Uh, so just a couple of days ago, she was working on a story for the New York Times and it was a big, complicated story, and she was feeling a little lost in it. And she asked me to read a draft and give her some feedback. And so I, I told her what I thought was working and what wasn't. And then she tore it apart and she redid it. And you know, there are other times where I, I write something very quickly for my newsletter, and then I think, am I being clear? Like, do people know what the hell I'm talking about? And so I'll just run up and I'll read it to her. It's really, really helpful to have that resource. And I think what ultimately makes it work is respecting that this is the other person's work. And my job is to help them achieve the thing that they are setting out to do rather than to impose my own vision upon the thing that they are doing. I love that. Such a great way to articulate it. It it makes me think of when I'm at home with my wife, who is an artist, and she may ask me to take a look at a piece of, of work or a piece of art that she created. She's a painter, by the way. And I often find it challenging to want to give a response that is from the heart. I, I want to be honest, but I'm also I, I also want to make sure that I'm providing something of of value, not just using words, but saying something that's going to be meaningful, something that's going to actually I either help her uh, embrace her talent, uh, give her a a hand up, things like that. And and I think the the, the questions that you just posed and gave to us that you work through with your wife, I think are excellent questions for us all to consider, whether it's in our personal lives or our professional lives. And I'm certainly going to apply some of that in, uh, in, in my conversations with my wife around her work that she produces. So thank you for sharing that. The other thing that I heard, Jason, that I, I just wanted to ask you about is around thinking differently, thinking bigger. What mm-hmm. what are some of the things that you do today to push yourself to think differently and to think bigger? Is it surrounding yourself with certain people? Is it the, the types of uh, content that you consume? Share with our audience what that looks like and why that's so important to continue to challenge your own thinking and your own beliefs. So I am obsessed with a question, and that question is, what am I missing? That question can drive a lot of anxiety for me, but also I think that it really pushes me because I feel like I'm always missing something. We're all missing things. And and so if I am if I am building my podcast and it is not growing as fast as some other people's podcasts, Instead of just feeling jealous of what they they are, you know, what they have, I like to ask myself, what am I missing? Like, what am I, what, what am I not seeing? What am I not understanding? What am I not trying or doing? Sometimes what I'm missing is that I have committed myself to something that I thought was really valuable, but that turns out to maybe not be as important as I thought it was, and it's too kind too time consuming. Or that uh, you know, maybe what I'm missing is that I'm actually being too limited in how I think about how I relate to my audience or you know whatever the case is. I, I really I try to ask myself of that all the time. I also try to consume things that show me that the boundaries aren't where I think they are. I, I, I actually don't really like business books, for example. I don't read them. And the reason is because they're they're kind of predictable. Like I, I just feel like I know what people are going to say, and nobody is doing challenging or interesting formats. Understandably, my business book doesn't have a challenging or interesting format. But what I really like is listening to a podcast or consuming something that is just a little bonkers, but that shows me. You know, the boundary for how to tell a story or how to communicate isn't where you think it is. I remember watching John Taffer 
on stage. Um, John Taffer is the host of Bar Rescue. He's become a friend of mine. And the, the first time I saw him on stage, I thought to myself, this guy is going way beyond what I thought was an acceptable level of energy and like <laughs> loudness and animation on stage. And it makes me think, how else can I be really engaging on stage? Like he's doing something that I thought was beyond what I thought was the limit. And that's not to say that I should do exactly what he does, but it does make me wonder what am I not doing right now? And that is far more inspiring to me than just consuming more of the same. So being alert to what others are doing and then, you know, almost thinking of it like that old Donald Rumsfeld, you know, there are known knowns, there are unknown, known unknowns, and then there are unknown unknowns. I'm really obsessed with the unknown unknowns. What do I not know that I don't know? And then what little scraps in the world can be evidence that I'm missing something? And then how can I try to go illuminate that? So a couple of things to that point then. Mm -hmm. One being in terms of unknown unknowns and the what am I missing? So what was one thing that you took from John Taffer that you began to implement in your own speaking career? So John is a yeller. He yells, he moves, he sweats. And after I saw that, I tried to, I, I'm already pretty high energy. I tried to amp up what I was doing. And I found that I was doing, I, I went in the wrong direction. I was doing too much of it. And then I had to dial it back. And frankly, that was another place where my wife played a large role because she she watched one of my talks in person. And um, and she afterwards, her big, her big piece of feedback was like, there are times where you're yelling at the audience and it's uncomfortable. And I realized that, you know, I needed to take some DNA from what John was doing and then like absorb it into my own style. Um, I think that probably before I saw John, I was, I probably didn't hold the stage physically as well as I do. I wasn't as thoughtful about how I move. I bet I was just pacing back and forth, but he has a real intentionality to the way that he moves. Now, the way that he moves is, you know, he's a big guy and he uses that, that he uses that size and the way that he holds himself and, and he sweats and you could just, and, and that's not my brand or my body, frankly, but I, I, in thinking about, okay, I don't need to do what John's doing, but I need to be as intentional as he is about what he's doing. I need to think more about my body. I need to think more about when do I go loud and when do I use that? Instead of John can use it 20 times because that's his brand. That's not what people expect from me. So I'll use it once and I'll use it at a time when it's going to really matter. And then also, you know, John goes really loud as a way of grabbing people's attention. But what if I actually inverse it and sometimes go really soft yeah. as a way to bring people in? Again, it's about intentionality. It's not about the, this is why I like the idea of the DNA, right? Like the, the thing that he is doing is that he is being loud and physical, but the DNA of it is intentionality about how he uses his voice and his body. And that was what I ultimately needed to learn from him. It took some time. I, I, I probably, I copied a little too much of the, 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 the elements of what he was doing. And then I realized I actually needed the intentionality of it. And that made a big difference. Amazing. Are you there today? Do you, do you feel like you've reached that, that point today where you've taken what you wanted to learn, you've applied it, you have integrated that with your own personality and you're hitting on all cylinders. W would you say that you are there or are there still areas that you're continuing to to work on, to hone? And, and if so, what are those areas? There is always something to work on. So I, a after I learn something, you go through the process where you say, I do not really know how to do this, but I'm going to get comfortable at it. Once you get past that, then 
I think that you reach, or at least I generally reach a place where I say, I have figured this out. But that is not to say that I can't get much better at it. And so where I am right now is that I feel like I have a pretty good mastery of, if I get on a stage, I have a very good mastery of of what to do. I know how to hold myself. I know how to talk. I know how to engage the audience. I have a deep well of material. I could go for hours. But I also know that in two years, if I look back at a video of me right now, I will think that it was a rough cut and that the thing that I learned in the intervening two years made me much better. And I think that I will always think that for my entire life. I don't think there will ever be a time where I could go a 10-year span or even a two-year span and look back and think I was just as good yesterday as I am today. I don't think that we should ever think that. So yeah, I feel very confident in what I do, but I also know that there are things that I'm missing that I still have yet to learn. Mm, Beautiful. I think always maintaining that, that learner's mind, that white belt mentality, always no matter how far you've come, no matter what you've been able to achieve, no matter what you've accomplished in in business and life, always realizing that we can learn more. And if we stay that way, if we maintain with that type of of mentality, there's it's unlimited in terms of what our potential could be and where we could possibly go. So and you, I, you know and you know what's fun is that once you start once you feel like you've mastered the big things right like I just again with speaking uh with speaking I've mastered the big things which is to say I have the material I feel comfortable on stage I'm not nervous before I talk those are those are big things to to have spent you know now you get to focus on the little things and it's the little things that 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 almost make the biggest difference so one I mean I, I just spoke at Google and it was it was in person. And afterwards, uh, I, I had a I had a friend in the audience and um and she she told me afterwards, she's like, You want you want some feedback? And I said, Yeah. And she said, I thought it was awesome. Um, and so I'm gonna be really nitpicky because I thought that you basically did everything great. And then she gave me a whole bunch of really nitpicky feedback, and one of them was that in the QA, after someone asks a question. I said that's an interesting question three times. After three three questions, I said, "Oh, that's an interesting question," and mm-hmm. then I went on to answer the question. And she was like, "You don't need to do that. That's that's a weird filler." And also, it's like, "Well, then, what about the other questions? Were they not interesting questions?" And um, and I and she's like, "You know, it doesn't really, it doesn't make a difference. The, the audience, nobody in that audience is going to be like, I liked the talk, except for the three times that guy said that's an interesting question, but." All of those little moments are ways in which you polish, and then also it keeps you aware of how else to improve. I love that. Today, I've done, I, you know, I, I, I tend to record a couple podcasts a day, and I, I said that's an interesting question at some point in the first first podcast of the day. And I then immediately thought of my friend at Google who pointed out that that's a thing that I said, it's like a tick. And I said, I caught myself, I'm not doing that again. And I hope that that's true. There's always these little, these little screws to tighten. Love that. That's fantastic. So I want to switch gears here for, for a moment because your latest book, Build for Tomorrow, first of all, for all of you that are watching and listening right now, You've been listening to Jason. Jason, and I'll share this with you, he writes the way that he speaks. Energy, great content, intelligence, articulate, very, very well written. Also, if you buy the book on Audible, you'll actually hear Jason doing the narration, and that's awesome in and of itself. So your latest book, it really, it's a guide to resilience and adapting quickly in the face of change. And in this book, you provide remarkable stories and exercises. It's really a toolkit that can help us use the power of change to our advantage. And and I wanted to spend just a a couple of minutes, because obviously we can't go deep on this. We want to encourage everyone to buy a copy, which we're going to link to. But you you you. really go into detail about the four phases of change, which is really the, the heart of this book. So 
briefly take us through the four changes. And if you can give maybe a quick example, something that our audience can take away that they can think about and perhaps apply in their own careers. Sure. So the four phases of change, what I argue is that everybody goes through change in the same four phases, panic, adaptation, new normal, and wouldn't go back. Wouldn't go back being the moment where you say, I have something so new and valuable that I wouldn't want to go back to a time before I had it. And my argument is that wouldn't go back is available to everybody and everybody feels panic. The difference maker is that People who are incredibly adaptable, who move quickly through moments of change, who find new opportunities first, those people operate with a clear-eyed understanding of themselves and the transferable value that they have so that when the things that they are comfortable with start to be challenged or disappear, they say, but I know what my true value is and I know that there are other ways to do it. And that they therefore spend less time panicking, which is really worrying about loss, and instead start to try to figure out what the gain looks like and then move towards it. And what I try to give people, and I appreciate your um your your support there of the book and and praise of it, is lessons insights, tools, exercises that people can use to to go through that process. Um, and you know I, I I I tend to talk as you've learned in the last 30 or so minutes that we've talked in, in sort of complete anecdote. So I I could without speaking straight for the next 30 minutes, um, I'll just tell you that you know one of the things in, in panic um, that we need to do is we need to, identify why we feel loss and why we equate change with loss and then come up with some frameworks so that when we experience change, we start to seek the gain, hypothesize the gain. What good could come of this and how could I put that to use? The more that we start to filter our experiences through those kinds of questions, the more we can start to test out our hypotheses and 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 run little experiments. Um, when we adapt, we must start to have a clear-eyed understanding of of what our identity is separate from the things that we do every day. We tend to identify with the output of our work with the role that we occupy. But we need to think deeper than that. We need to be aware of who and what we are at a at a, at a really core level. I, I, I use and uh, explain in the book how I got there, but I use this line to understand myself, which is I tell stories in my own voice, totally separate from magazines or books or podcasts or anything else. You know, as we move into new normal, we need to learn how to treat failure as data so that we can start to see how everything that we do, even if it doesn't work out, is actually just information that we can use to build into what we do next. And then as we get to wouldn't go back, we need to start to understand what is it that we see that other people don't see or that we we can... I have, I have, so I'm trying to figure out how to sort of summarize without summarizing. But anyway, I have, there's a chapter in there called the 99% there problem, which is, which is often that I think people tend to mistake small problems for large problems and to not be able to recognize when they have made significant progress. We tend to filter things through a question of, is this perfect rather than through the better question of, is our new problem better than our old problem? And that the more that we're able to understand progress through problems, the more that we can focus on refinement rather than replacement. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And, and again, I want to mention to our audience that you this book will challenge you to think differently. So there, are, yes, there are exercises in the book. The way the book is written and some of what, what Jason just shared with us will have us asking different kinds of questions, which ultimately lead to different results. Right. So 
through this book, you will learn to embrace change. You'll learn to navigate. You'll learn to build resistance. You'll learn to, or resilience. You'll learn to ask those better questions. So Jason, as we're wrapping up our conversation, what is one or two, or what are one or two of the bigger questions that you're asking yourself today? Hmm. Well, you know, I mean, I gave you one of those big ones, which is, which is what am I missing? I also, I always ask, what is this for? I I like to challenge just because I'm doing something doesn't mean that it is the best thing that I could be doing, or even that it serves a role in my life the way that it used to. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about making a pretty big change. And for example, what I'm doing in podcasting right now, because I've started to come to the conclusion that something that I've been working on for a very long time might I might have gotten what it was for already. You know, I I, I might have gotten it, and so why am I continuing to do it? I'm not sure that it's going to continue to to provide new value, and maybe it's time to spend that time and energy on another project. So I'm pushing myself to be really thoughtful and mindful about that. And then I'm also, I guess I'm, I'm also trying to think, um, am I spending my time on the micro and the macro in the way that is most meaningful and sets me up for the greatest success going forward? Uh, I, I, sometimes I catch myself doing something that I could totally hand off to somebody else. Um, or just spending extra time futzing with something that doesn't need to be futzed with. And Bethany Frankel, I interviewed her for the for Entrepreneur Magazine a long time ago, and she had this nice way of putting it, which is she's like, look, you could think of it like this: there are an infinite number of buckets and a limited number of limited amount of water. So you can have as many buckets in your life as you want, but you only have a limited amount of water to fill those buckets. So. What do you want? Do you want 20 buckets that are just fractionally filled? Or do you want to get rid of a lot of those buckets so that you have five buckets and they're all full? Um, You got to spend time where it's going to matter. And sometimes spending a little bit of time on a lot of things just gets you a little. Um, It's a problem that I've set up for myself because I am endlessly curious and want to do a lot of things. And so I'm I'm trying to check those instincts in a way, or at least build smarter structures so that I'm able to do more without it all requiring my hours. So good. So good. Everyone, I hope that you will go back, rewind, and listen to this episode. Jason has shared so much value here. And also make sure you do go out and buy a copy of his latest book, Build for Tomorrow. Pick up a copy of the book itself, as well as the Audible version. I find value in having both. It it makes a a big difference for me in how I read and how I consume and learn information. So, Jason, thank you so very much for joining us today on Business Minds Coffee Chat. I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for sharing your insights, for being open and vulnerable, and showing up at the level of energy that you always have. It just really does blow my mind. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. This was this was a delight. I appreciate it. Hey, it's Jay. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that one as much as I did. I do have a quick favor to ask. Would you please take a moment to subscribe, rate, and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts? That helps the podcast grow, expand its reach, and attract amazing guests that allow us to continue to bring you incredible content. And to enjoy more episodes, all you need to do is visit jshearbusinessconsulting.com, click that podcast button, And until next time, keep learning and growing, and I look forward to catching up with you on the next Business Minds Coffee Chat. Take care, everybody.